I don't remember the year, but I, my business, was, I developed it, it was growing, and we were fast becoming one of the top-notch companies in our field. I pioneered many new things and I was very happy uh, with my life, and my marriage, and the children and what have you. And I'd, I kept a sort of tenuous relationship with the tabernacle, the full gospel, because that's my wife's background. And she knew all the ladies and it was a great thing for her. And I had all my business and sporting connections, so we were compatible, I felt, and we were happy. And then we were told in the church that a chap by the name of Branham was coming from America, and this guy was so wonderful, he could raise the dead and the blind would see and the lame walk and, you know, all those things. And they printed brochures which claimed that, that the lame will walk and the blind will see. And they started prayer meetings all over Durban and uh, he was coming and they'd booked the city hall for a week or something and it went on. And they were looking for people that would act as sidesmen, take the offering, uh, you know, general workers for the outreach. So I gave my name uh, out and um, I was part of it. So I had to go to these counselling sessions. So when people gave their hearts to the Lord, you had set prayers, you know, and you they had decision cards, you had to get them to write their name and, and so on. And, you know, would you like a visit from the minister and, uh, and all those kind of questions. And and how to lead somebody to the Lord. And I went through that with everybody else for a couple of weeks. And then he arrived in Johannesburg. Now, my father happened to be in Johannesburg at the time. And I asked my dad, please do me a favor, but go and listen to this chap, Branham, whom I'd never met and didn't know. I said, and... Um, let me know what you think about him because I'll invite some of my business friends uh, if he's okay. Well, when my dad came back to Durban, he, he said to me, I've never seen anything like it. He said there was a girl there crippled and she just threw her crutches away and she walked and my dad burst into tears. And um, my father was a tough person. It was so unlike my dad that it impressed me. Then he goes to Pretoria, and then he went, I think it was in Kimberley, when the rumours came to, to back to Durban that he was a, uh, I forget what he was called, but he, doesn't, he did not believe in the Trinity, they said. And therefore the Pentecostals who had combined in Durban, they said they're not going to have him, he must be a false teacher, a false prophet. But I looked at it from a business point of view. And I thought, well, that's odd. They've printed all the brochures. They've got all the adverts in the newspaper. They've hired the city hall. Uh, they got everything. they printed all the cards. They're just going to throw all that money away. And so I called Mr. Walter Dove of Dove's Funeral Parlor and Johnny Johnson, who I think was with African Life, if I remember right, three Scotsmen, um, including myself. And I said, look here, there's a business deal. We can't go wrong here. We invite the guy to come. They've already told him don't come. They sent a telegram to him not to come to Durban. We'll just take over. We'll get the money. We'll take all the offerings. We got it made. You could, uh, there's no overheads. There's nothing. And we convinced ourselves that this was real a business deal you couldn't slip on. So we found out where he was. And by this time, he'd reached Cape Town. I'm not sure if he was holding meetings in Cape Town or not. I can never remember that. But we got him in a hotel in Cape Town. And I spoke to him and I said, Mr. Brenham, uh, we know that the, uh, un the United uh, Pentecostal Churches of Durban have asked you and told you you're not welcome. But there are three businessmen and we prefer to sponsor you. We will pay for your accommodation in Durban We'll pay for your air ticket from Cape Town to Durban uh, and we'll pay for your air ticket from Durban to Johannesburg. He said, okay, he's coming. 
I gave him our address, the number if he needed to contact us. He uh, gave me a flight because uh, it was pre-booked. This is his flight. We'll meet him in Durban. So I phoned old Walter Dove and uh, Johnny Johnson. I said, we got it. We're in. We're in. We can't go wrong. But our problem was now to have who's going to take the offering because that's all we're now interested in. He could have taught anything. He could have said Mugabe is, is God as far as we were concerned. We're going to make us money. And so what I did was I got some cricket mates and a couple of boxing mates and wherever I could, they are going to take the offering. So that was fixed. First night is when I met him. He came here Monday. Met him but, and he came with a group, um, four or five people, which took us by surprise. We, we just thought he was on his own, but he had four or five people with him. One of whom was a Baxter, a Bible teacher, a par excellence, I, the, one of the best I've ever heard in my life. And they arrived, and so we let them have two days break. We, we were being very magnanimous, I mean, you know, not working for two days and uh, they could wander the beach. But what, <clears throat> what we figured that they'd go around the beach and walk around and get rejuvenated and what have you. Instead of that, we found out that when we want to go and see him, we could never see him because he's always praying, fasting and praying. And to me uh, and, jo and Johnny and Walter, that was religion, man. What's, you know, we, they don't work anymore. So we just didn't worry about him. Now comes Wednesday night. At four o'clock, we made sure he was in the hotel, that he was ready, he understood. He has to be there at quarter to eight. We got a car, and I forget who went to fetch him. Quarter to eight. Well, the city hall was packed. The town hall was packed. And um, we, there were about six chairs up on the platform. There's no, no church represented. There was nothing. And I'd never... I mean, the city hall holds 2,000 people. They packed in the aisles. The fire department is wanting me to clear the aisles so they're not going to let us hold a meeting. I mean, it, it, it didn't go all that smoothly, but we did. Uh, the, the fellow who's going to lead the singing for the church group, he came. So we had that fixed up. So he did the singing and he had an organist and they did some singing and what have you. We took the offering. And Walter came and told me, he said, Bob, we got six cardboard boxes filled with money and with decision cards. So if a cardboard box, you know, about that size, I don't, so I can, all I can see dollars in, in my eyes and everybody's eyes. This is, we are making money. We can't go wrong. But now it's about five to eight and this guy isn't pitched up. And I'm waiting, and I got up and I announced, well, uh, he's running late, he, he's coming, but I went and sat down. And so the singer carried on singing a bit. Now, Branham arrives. And don't mean I hadn't met him. You know, Others had met him, but I hadn't met him. So now I, we shook hands, and he sits down next to me, smaller than me. And I found out he's a hillbilly. He can hardly talk English. You can't, you know, little Al Abner, that comic guy, that's how he talks. I thought, oh, man, have we got a problem here. And then I said to him, well, I'll, I'll introduce you. You ready? No, he said to me. Don't introduce me yet. I'm waiting for the angel of the Lord. Ooh, this is getting spooky. So I moved my chair a bit away. I thought, oh, this is getting like a spiritual meeting, a spiritus meeting, I'm waiting for the angel. And afterwards, he said the angels appeared, and uh, I thought, oh boy, no wonder they didn't want him. He, he's odd. So I then introduced him, and I knew very little about him, so he got a very, uh, I, I flowered it up as best I could, but I didn't know too much. But what I had also done, I'd got the Addington Hospital, the um, chap in charge, was a member of the Caledonian Society, and he got three terminal cases and put them in, we'd put them in the front of the city hall with a sister, and there were two doctors that I knew of in the audience. Now, they, they are lying in the stretch of the patients with a tube in them, being fed, I don't know what it was, but something. He walked, to, he read the scripture, which I don't think 
we really understood with his hillbilly accent. He did about five minutes talking on the scriptures. He walked to the end of the platform and he looked at the first person in on a stretch and he said, the medical profession have said you suffer from this and this and this and this and that's not true. What you've suffered from is this and this and this and Jesus is now healing you. Get up and walk. And then he went to the next one. Well, before he started to speak to the next one, the woman, she just sat bolt upright, yanked the thing that was in her arm, yanked it right out. The nursing sister screamed and one of the doctors in the uh, audience ran out to help. But by this time, the second one's healed. Same thing happened. And the third one, and then it was pandemonium. All over, people were weeping, crying, carrying on. Uh, and then I realized this is the best thing that could have happened. Tomorrow night, we'll be overflowing, you know. Thursday night came. Well, what happened Thursday afternoon, William Baxter, I think he's William, he did a Bible teaching and I went there. Ern Baxter. Ern Baxter. That's, that's the guy. Ern Baxter. That's, oh, man. And he, I can remember what he taught. He taught on um, when you be coming to the land. When you be coming to the land. I can see him doing that. And I knew I'd come into a new land here. I'd never seen anything like this. I was in a new land when the, the terminal cases, the fellow from Addington, Mac, well, whatever his name was, I can't remember, uh, he phoned me at the office. He said, Bob, there's nothing wrong with those three patients. Can I send some more? Well, I said, yeah, you can. But he, he didn't, incidentally, and I'm glad he didn't because... The place was packed. When the cleaners came in the morning to clean the city hall, the people rushed in when they opened the doors in the morning for the evening meeting. And they wouldn't leave. The superintendent of the city hall is phoning me. He wants the people out. He's got to clean the hall. And they won't leave. I said, well, I didn't book the hall. The churches did, not me. Go and phone the churches. And not me. I didn't do it. I felt I got away with that one. And guess what? But now the newspapers have picked it up and they've got stories about all these healings. So I thought, oh, well, on Thursday, there were more people in the town gardens than there was in the city hall. Catherine's radio or whatever they were, he came to me and he said his wife or daughter or auntie, somebody had been healed. And he was going to, he'd put the public address system in the town gardens free. The police came to me in, that afternoon and said, you have created a traffic jam at the city hall. You, you should have notified us. You should have done. I said, well, how do I know? I mean, you know, how do I know? He, he said, you've got to do something. So I, I said, well, I know nothing. And then I got the idea, you know what I should do? I'll go to the race course. I know that the Snowy is in charge of the race course. And I'll ask what it'll cost us if we take the grandstand, because the grandstand could seat about four to 5,000 people, I figured. As I arrived at the race course, who should come out but Snowy? It was like a divine sort of thing. I said to him, Snowy, and he was a Catholic, by the way. I said, Snowy, they... Um, you, you know what's happening at City Hall. It's all in the newspaper, he said, yeah. I said, well, the City Hall's too small. Do you think we could use your race course grandstand? And he said to me, for that, you can do what you want. I'll see. I'll clear it with the board on Monday. You've got the race course. So I was able to announce that on, on the Friday that tomorrow we'll, we're going to meet in the race course, not in a City Hall. And I got my crew to go and make a platform. We put it right at the winning post, a platform about two feet high, old scaffold plank, uh, put it there. And then something happened that I can only, I can't really, I don't have the words to explain. Ambulances began to arrive. 
and discharge the sick and the lame and the dying and bring them in about one o'clock. The meeting scheduled for eight, they here at one o'clock in a hot, humid day. I notice people, black, white, yellow, green, or every creed just walking, and they're all coming to this race course. I'm trying to hurry my men up to finish the platform. Catherine's is donating free the PA system. Uh, there's a lot of activity. The police are now telling me to cancel the meeting because uh, they'd never seen black and white mix before because apartheid was, had been introduced by then. What are we going to do, sort of? Uh, then they were, we, we heard through the police, they were sending reinforce, military reinforcements from Pretoria for Huchter or someplace like Voortrekker for Huchter or something down to Durban because they're expecting a race riot. And one minister told me, one pastor, he said, today there'll be blood on your hands because they're going to kill one another here. He said, uh, you can't mix these people. Well, all I know is that people just keep coming. Eventually, the, you couldn't get another person in the grandstand. You couldn't get them in the gold ring. You, it, it was just people, people, people. And there were so many people outside. In those days, there was not the picket fence around the race course like we had now. It was a wooden fence. And, you know, and there were so many people that they just pushed the fences in. They filled the golf course that's in the center of the race course. It was just people. So I said, you better get Branham early. Let's get this thing behind us uh, because it's looking dangerous. I mean, it was. And so we brought him up a bit early and put him on the platform and he was sharing the word. And all I can say is, if you know, if you know Durban at all, the bluff on the south, it was like a very far distant thunder, which suddenly was rushing towards us and of course got louder and louder. And by the time it reached the race course, it was a roar. And it hovered over us maybe for two or three minutes and then went off. People jumped out of stretches. People jumped out of wheelchairs. Things got thrown in the air. Uh, Ron Mayer, who uh, well-known Durham character, uh, he came because he, he was part of Red Cross and there was we hadn't laid water on for all these people. We hadn't done it. We didn't know. The Red Cross came to our aid. And so he was go going around distributing a mug of water for people to drink when he said he had, a, he had to start ducking because just where he was was where all the crutches and the people just threw them in there and came down and hit you on the head. So he had to take, uh, and he said people were dancing and jumping. He's standing there with a bucket of water and a tin cup. And he said he couldn't believe what happened. He said he heard the thunder, the rolling thunder as he called it. He said, but he didn't realize that everybody was getting healed. He didn't think about that. His job was to give them water. And he said, suddenly his crutches are falling all around him. And he had to protect himself. It was so mind-boggling, the, the shouting, the screaming. And I noticed how people reacted. Funny, it just... The Zulus want to wave something. So they pull out tufts of grass. They pull a fence out and they wave it. Or they, they do anything. Uh, the, the, the Indians more or less dance, some kind of dance. The whites stand and clap. And, and I, I remember that strange sort of thing. But when it was over, about 9, 9.30, 10 o'clock, it looked like a battlefield. There were broken stretches. Some people just left a wheelchair. They didn't even bother to take a wheelchair back with them. They just left them lying there. But there were sticks, walking sticks, crutches. Somebody told me that they took a one-ton truck to move everything. But the damage done to the race course, because p people try to climb up the downpipes to get on the roof to get a view of Branham, some people stood, so many people stood on the benches, the benches collapsed. Uh, it, the railings around the race course were broken. I mean, 
we knew we were going to have to pay, but as old Walter kept reminding me, don't worry, Bob, we've got plenty of money, we've got plenty of cash. Well, when it was on, we walked out about half past 11 that night. We made sure the whole race course was empty, and then we went out. And there were about 10 or 12 ambulances there, and the drivers were sitting on a pavement playing cards. And I went to them and I said, what are you guys waiting for? We're waiting for that thing to finish. I said, it's finished. They said, no, well, we're waiting for our patients. I said, the patients are all gone home. The guys looked at me. I said, what do you mean they're all gone home? I said, they're all healed. They've gone. And there's a, I don't know what year it was, but if you get that mercury, they had a picture of it. Six or seven ambulances standing empty. And everybody's gone home. Now, yes, we were happy. We were thrilled. And I have to tell you that behind all of that, when it was successful, the ministers come because they want to have their photographs taken with Branham. We, on our side, we don't want to have anything to do with it now because we're going to make a cash profit. And if we're going to make cash profit, we were worrying, how do we hide it from the receiver of revenue? So we don't want, the, we don't want our names and things in the paper because that, then the receiver's going to pick it up. So we're trying to stay in the background the now the, the church leaders, they want to be in the front, so we don't mind. that It's cover for us, you know, that was our attitude. So we go to sleep that night, and we wake up in the morning. Oh, first person in my office is Snowy. He said, are you getting me fired? He said, it's a disaster. The secretary of the golf club is threatening court action, and man, a lot. So I'm just giving instructions, fix it, fix it, fix it, you know. It took about four days for all the estimates and for all the repair work. And the only money that was left over by the time we paid all the damages was enough money for the three of us to take our wives and go and have dinner. That's all. Then it was clear. There was nothing. That was it. Now, we've got to take Branham to the airport. Well, in those days, you walked out out onto the airfield and then you climbed up steps, no walk-ons or like you got today. Well, the ministers and the pastors are all there and the photographers and they're all taking pictures, but the three stooges, we don't want to any publicity because we th we're hoping still that somehow we're going to make a profit out of this thing, you know, cash. Well, Branham then beckoned me to come over to him took me by the elbow and we walked away from everybody. And he said, I want to thank you. He said, when I left the United States, the Lord told me that Durban was going to be the scene of the greatest miracles I'd ever see. So I want to thank you. He said, but I also have to tell you that you will never make a profit from the gospel. And he proved it to be 100% correct. And then he put his hand on my head and he said, you will be sent overseas. You'll speak to governments. You'll speak to kings. You'll speak to princes. Uh, you'll go to people you don't know. Exactly what was said to me when a man prophesied over me in the full gospel tabernacle. So that was about 10 years later, say, or something like that. So that prophecy was said twice to me, and I still didn't accept it. I never owned a passport. I had no desire to travel. I didn't want to travel. Uh, I was very happy. But those, that prophecy has subsequently been fulfilled.